Good morning, everyone. It's good to see each one here. Very grateful for our visitors who've chosen to be with us. We're thankful for your presence. And should you have any questions about anything you hear here or see here or anything we do, please feel free to ask us after services are over. Last week, we looked at the topic of baptism and salvation by grace. We had a problem with the video and uh, could not post it. So I came here on Wednesday and re-recorded the sermon. So it is on uh, our Facebook, on our website, and uh, on YouTube also. So I wanted to make sure that everybody knew of that so that you might be able to, if you would like, see it yourself or share it with others. This morning, though, we're going to look at what I've entitled The Authority of the Believer. And what we're going to do is analyze the first chapter of John, verses 11 and 12. For that text says, He, Jesus, came to his own. His own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. As we look to this passage, in Protestant denominations, in particular those which follow the tenets and teachings of John Calvin, Many people teach and many more embrace the doctrine of salvation by faith only. As a matter of fact, in the Westminster Confession of Faith, the doctrine of salvation by faith only is described as a most wholesome doctrine. When we look to this doctrine, simply stated, it is that all you have to do is accept or believe in Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah, and that there's nothing else for you to do because Salvation comes at the point of faith, that salvation is granted to the individual at the time that they believe in Jesus Christ. Well, we need to see whether or not this doctrine is true. For if it is true, then all believers are saved. Anyone who believes in Jesus Christ then, if salvation is at the point of faith, has salvation. But we need to look and see Is that what the Bible teaches us? So in our lesson this morning, we're going to examine the doctrine of salvation by faith only in the light of the Bible. This is essential for us to do because the Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21 and said, Test all things, hold fast to what is good. Well, how can we know what is good? In the Old Testament, the prophet Micah, in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. The he here is God. God lets us know what is good. And we can go to his word to determine whether or not a teaching or a practice is good. So we're going to consider the topic by looking to what I call the authority of the believer in the following areas. We're going to look at the rights of believers. We're then going to consider two types of believers, And then finally, we'll conclude the lesson by drawing the conclusion that salvation is by an obedient faith. So, let's start by considering the rights of believers. Proponents of the doctrine of salvation by faith only use John chapter 3 and verse 16 as their proof text. It is a text you're probably already familiar with. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But as we look to this, this particular text and we see exactly what it teaches, it does not teach salvation by faith only. It is not teaching that salvation is granted at the point of faith. Notice it says it should not perish. The believer should not perish, not that one shall not perish. Now, we can go to many different translations, English translations, of the verse of John chapter 3 and verse 16 and see what scholars think of it. The New King James Version that I use says, should not perish. The Revised Standard Version says, should not perish. The New American Standard Version says, should not perish. The American Standard Version says, should not perish. The English Standard Version says, should not perish. The King James Version says, should not perish. Now the New International says shall not perish along with the Living Bible. It also says shall not perish. But I want you to understand these last two translations were 
translated by those who believe in the doctrine of Calvinism and being influenced by Calvinism in their translation of the text, they change the idea of should not perish to the shall not perish. So if salvation is not granted at the point of belief, then what is given to the believer that he should not perish, according to John 3.16. Believers have the right to become children of God. Let's go back to John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. Again, speaking of Jesus, he came to his own. His own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. In the Greek, the word that is translated right in the English, according to Barclay M. Newman in his Greek-English Dictionary of the New Testament says, it means authority, right, and liberty, ability, capability. So as we look to this word, what we're talking about is the authority, the right to become a child of God, ability to become a child of God, capability to make that decision. This same word that is translated right in our text is found in Luke, the seventh chapter in verse eight, and there it is translated authority. It is spoken by the centurion at Capernaum who sought out Jesus to heal his servant. Luke chapter seven, verse eight, for I also, this centurion said, am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. So this is an illustration of authority, one having the authority to do this thing. The same word is found in Acts chapter five and verse four, and there it is translated control. In this text, it's spoken by the Apostle Peter to Ananias when Peter told Ananias that the proceeds of that which he had sold was under his control. Remember, Ananias and his wife Sapphira were trying to pose as if they were giving all of the funds they had received for selling their product, but in turn, they were lying. They were keeping back a portion for himself. And that's why Peter said, while it was yours, it was under your control. Look at the text. While it remained, was it not your own? After it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So, having it under one's control. This same word is found in John, the 19th chapter, in verse 10. And there it is translated power. It's spoken by Pilate, the Roman prefect in Jerusalem, when he asked Jesus, do you not know that I have power to crucify you, power to release you? So as we look to the use of this word in the New Testament, it means authority, control, and power. So by John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, saying that believers have the right or our liberty become children of God, having the authority to do so, it affirms that not all who believe are automatically children of God, that only the opportunity to become children of God has been given unto believers. They have the right to become a child of God. They have the authority to choose to become a child of God. They are at liberty to make that choice. But that doesn't mean that they are automatically those who have salvation, those who are automatically children of God. For the Bible presents unto us two types of believers. The first type is those who reject their right to become children of God. This covered many of the rulers of the Jews, according to John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. As these rulers had the right to become children of God, they rejected that right, and thus they were not saved. Look at John 12, beginning in verse 42. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, in Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. I want you to notice it says they did not confess him. They believed in him, but they did not confess him. 
Now let's go to Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 32. Jesus speaking said, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. These were believers, but these were believers who rejected their right to become children of God. They had the authority to do so, but they did not choose to do it. And because they did not confess their belief in Jesus Christ, Jesus said, I will not confess them before my Father in heaven. I will deny them. Thus, these individuals were not saved, even though they believed. There's also King Agrippa. The Apostle Paul was making a defense of himself before King Agrippa and Festus. In Acts the 26th chapter, King Agrippa said to Paul while Paul was making a defense, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Almost, but not saved. Look at Acts 26, verse 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Agrippa believed what the prophets had written concerning Jesus Christ, concerning the Messiah. The Apostle Paul, without a doubt, knew that Agrippa believed what the prophets had said. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. Here was a believer. Paul said, I know you believe these things concerning the Messiah. I know you believe these things concerning Jesus Christ. But Agrippa responded by saying, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Almost is not enough. He believed, but he was not a Christian. He was not a child of God. He was not saved, even though he believed. So there are believers that reject their right to become children of God, reject the salvation that is in Jesus Christ. The second type of believer that we're going to look to are those who exercise their right to become children of God. In Acts the 8th chapter, Philip, the evangelist, was called from Samaria to go down to the road that led from Jerusalem to Gaza because there was an Ethiopian man who was riding along in the chariot reading the Isaiah scroll. As a matter of fact, he was reading Isaiah chapter 53 that speaks of the suffering servant, which is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. This man asked Philip to join him in this chariot in which he was riding. And Philip, beginning at Isaiah 53, preached Jesus to him. He desired to be saved. He knew he had the right. And in the end, he rejoiced in his salvation. Let's look at Acts 8, verse 36. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? He understood that in the preaching of Jesus, baptism was an integral part of it. Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He was willing to confess his belief in Jesus, not like those rulers of the Jews who would not. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. He went on his way rejoicing because his belief in Jesus Christ prompted him to obey that which Christ would have him to do in order to become a child of God, in order to have salvation. In Romans 10 and verse 10, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. In Acts 2, 38, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts twenty two sixteen. Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's why this man could go on his way rejoicing. He knew he had salvation. He knew he was a child of God because he exercised his right to become a child of God. There's also Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul. His sins were washed away. Paul at first, as Saul of Tarsus, was not a believer. Matter of fact, he was on his way to the city of Damascus to persecute Christians there. 
to consent to them being put in prison. But the Lord Jesus appeared to him on that road, and Saul's life changed. In Acts 22, verse 6, Paul is retelling what had happened. He said, Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon. Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light, were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus. There you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. Since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. He spent three days in the city of Damascus, weeping and praying, waiting to know what he was to do. For now he believed in Jesus Christ. Verse 12, then one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one, Jesus, and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now, while you are waiting, Arise and be baptized. Now wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's exactly what Saul did. Saul was now a believer. Where once he had been persecuting the way, now he embraced it. And he believed in Jesus Christ. And he exercised his authority, his right to become a child of God and have the salvation of his soul. There's also the Jewish priests that we see in Acts the 6th chapter. Verse 7, the first portion of Acts chapter 6, the Grecian widows were being neglected in the daily administration, and the apostles saw fit to choose men who would take care of that so they would not be neglected. Then in verse 7 it says, The word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. I want you to look at that phrase, obedient to the faith. They were believers and they were obedient to the faith. Their belief in Jesus Christ prompted them to give obedience to what he would have them to do. That faith is the same faith that Jude said in his short one chapter book in verse 3, that it was once for all delivered unto the saints. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they were obedient to the gospel, obedient to the faith. Well, what was the result of being obedient to the faith. When we consider that, Christ is the author of eternal salvation to those who obey him. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9 said, though he were a son, that he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And thus he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So through Jesus Christ, one has the opportunity for salvation. And that gospel was made known to all nations for the obedience to the faith. The Apostle Paul wrote by inspiration in Romans chapter 16, verses 25 and 26. Now that gospel, according to Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, <clears throat> is God's power unto salvation. So when these were obedient to the faith, they were saved by an obedient faith, manifested in their submission to the gospel, their obedience to its commands. They were saved because salvation is by an obedient believer. Since people are saved by an obedient faith, when or at what point does faith save him? Does it save them at the point of belief? Does it save them at the point of faith? What's the answer? Mark 16, 16 provides the answer. For it says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. This text reveals 
Two conditions for salvation. Belief or faith and baptism. It also reveals the condition for damnation. That is unbelief. A lack of faith is all it takes to be lost. Again, Mark, by inspiration, said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, recording the words of Jesus exactly. But he said, He who does not believe will be lost. Yes, one needs to believe, but that belief should allow them to continue to be obedient unto the Lord and do what the Lord would have them to do for salvation. Because all it takes is a lack of faith to be lost. Look at John chapter 3, verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Salvation, yes, is by faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, as the Apostle Paul was summarizing what goes into one's salvation, that salvation is by grace through faith. Grace, as we saw last week, is God's part. Faith is man's part. And man manifests that faith when he obeys that which Christ would have him to do in order to be a child of God. So salvation is dependent upon a believer being baptized into Christ. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And notice, it's in that order. It's not you believe or you're bap- uh, you believe and you're saved and then you're baptized to show your salvation. No, belief and baptism come before salvation. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 21 says baptism saves us. And Galatians 3, 26 and 27 affirms that fact. Peter said there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In baptism, one is buried into the death of Jesus Christ, according to Romans chapter 6. You're raised to walk in newness of life because your sins are forgiven. Remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus by night in John chapter 3. Jesus said, you must be born again, born of water and the Spirit. And we saw in our lesson last week, The water has to be baptism. The Spirit, the Spirit-directed Word, is what gives baptism that power. Look at Galatians 3, 26-27. You're all sons of God through faith. Yes, in Christ Jesus. Why? For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Your faith was manifested in such a way that it caused you to be obedient to that which Jesus commanded to be baptized. As we bring our lesson to a close, salvation is ascribed to many things. It's ascribed to faith. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. It is by grace, as we saw in Ephesians 2 and verse 8, by grace you have been saved through faith, not of works and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is ascribed to obedience. We read earlier, Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, that Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. If I'm going to be a recipient of the salvation that Jesus has made available, yes, I need to be obedient to him. And we said that confession is an integral part of salvation. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10 and verse 10. And the Apostle Peter tells us without a doubt that baptism now saves us. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. Proving that faith is essential to salvation doesn't prove that baptism is non-essential. Why? Baptism is an act faith obeys. It is that which Jesus has said that one is to do in order to have his sins remitted or forgiven. Baptism is faith in action. It's faith displayed. I believe in my heart that when I am baptized into the watery grave in the likeness of Christ's death and raised to walk in newness of life, my sins have been forgiven. That's faith. That's trust. In baptism, one renders 
obedience to the faith. Obedience to the Word of God, His power unto salvation. So the question is, as we close out our lesson, as a believer, have you exercised your right to become a child of God? If you have, hallelujah. If you haven't, we can help you do that. For behind this curtain is a baptistry filled with water, kept very clean by Robert, as a matter of fact. And we this very day can baptize you into Christ. And you'll be a child of God. You'll have the salvation of your soul. If we can help you, we want to. David's going to lead us in number 283. And we're going to stand and sing it in just a moment. And during that singing of that song, we encourage anyone who has a need to respond to the Lord whether it's to become a child of God or whether it's to return back to Him. Or possibly you just need the prayers of the saints to help you overcome problems in your life, temptations that you're dealing with as we saw in our Bible class. Whatever your need may be, let us help you solve your problem. Let us stand and sing the song David's going to lead us in. There is